the Nash equilibrium in real life. You are stuck in traffic. It's a complete gridlock. You look to your left and there's a lane that seems to be moving slightly faster. You look to your right, same thing. You desperately want to switch lanes. But here's the problem. Every other driver is thinking the exact same thing. If you move, you slow down that lane. If they move, they slow down yours. Eventually, everyone settles into a lane, and even though the traffic is terrible and everyone is miserable, no single person can improve their travel time by switching lanes unilaterally. You have entered a Nash equilibrium. Named after the mathematician John Nash, the guy played by Russell Crowe in A Beautiful Mind, this concept is the bedrock of modern strategy, and unfortunately, it explains why so many aspects of your life feel stuck. A Nash equilibrium describes a state in a game where no player can benefit by changing their strategy while the other players keep theirs unchanged. It is the mathematical definition of a stalemate. Think about standing at a concert. At first, everyone is sitting comfortably. Then, one enthusiastic fan in the front row stands up to get a better view. Now, the people behind him can't see, so they stand up. This ripple effect moves all the way to the back of the stadium. Eventually, everyone is standing. The view is exactly the same as when everyone was sitting, but now your legs are tired and you can't sit down because you'll see nothing. You are trapped in a Nash equilibrium. The optimal group outcome, everyone sitting, is unstable because the individual incentive to stand is too high. This law governs everything from nuclear arms races to why you feel compelled to wear a suit to a job interview, even though everyone would be more comfortable in pajamas. We are locked in suboptimal traps because we cannot trust others to coordinate with us. The Ultimatum Game – Fairness versus Logic Imagine I offer you $100, but there is a catch. I have to split this money with a stranger in another room. I can offer that stranger any amount I want, from one penny to the full hundred dollars. If the stranger accepts my offer, we both get the money. If the stranger rejects my offer, neither of us gets anything. The stranger knows the total is one hundred dollars. Now, pure logic, the kind economists used to believe ruled the world, dictates that the stranger should accept any offer greater than zero. Even one penny is better than nothing, right? A purely rational, profit-maximizing agent would take the penny. But that is not what happens. In real-life experiments conducted all over the world, if I offer anything less than about 30%, say I try to keep $70 and give them 30, the vast majority of people will reject the offer. They will choose to walk away with nothing just to ensure that I also get nothing. This is the ultimatum game, and it reveals a hidden mechanism in our brains that overrides basic math, the instinct for altruistic punishment. We are hardwired to punish unfairness, even at a personal cost. This isn't just pettiness, it's an evolutionary safeguard. In a tribal setting, letting someone get away with hoarding resources was a death sentence for the group. So, we developed a fairness switch that effectively says, I will burn this entire deal to the ground rather than let you exploit me. This is why you get irrationally angry when someone cuts in line, even if it only delays you by five seconds. It's why revolutions happen. We aren't profit maximizers. We are fairness enforcers. And knowing this changes how you negotiate everything, from your salary to who does the dishes. You aren't negotiating numbers, you are negotiating perceived respect. Why Selfishness is Mathematically Predictable Let's look at the most famous scenario in game theory, the prisoner's dilemma. Two bank robbers are arrested and put in separate interrogation rooms. The police don't have enough evidence to convict them of the major crime, only a minor one. They offer each prisoner a deal. If you betray your partner and testify against him, you go free and he gets 10 years. If you both stay silent, you both get just one year for the minor charge. But if you both betray each other, you both get five years. The math is cruel here. 
No matter what your partner does, your best individual move is always to betray him. If he stays silent, you betray him and go free. If he betrays you, you must betray him to avoid the 10-year sentence. Defection is the dominant strategy. This explains the depressing architecture of modern cynicism. Why do politicians run attack ads? Because if one side takes the high road, stays silent, and the other attacks, defects, the attacker wins. Why do athletes take performance-enhancing drugs? If everyone stays clean, the best athlete wins. But if your opponent is doping and you aren't, you lose. The logic of the prisoner's dilemma forces us into a race to the bottom, where rational individuals produce a distinctively irrational group outcome. We lock our doors not because we hate our neighbors, but because we cannot mathematically ensure they won't rob us. We stockpile resources, not because we are greedy, but because the cost of being the sucker who didn't stockpile is too high. Selfishness isn't always a moral failing. Often, it's just people who are good at math but bad at trust. Strategies of tit-for-tat in friendships So, is the world just a bleak landscape of inevitable betrayal? Surprisingly, no. In the 1980s, political scientist Robert Axelrod organized a massive computer tournament. He invited experts to submit programs that would play the prisoner's dilemma against each other repeatedly, thousands of times. He wanted to find the ultimate strategy for life. The winner wasn't a complex, devious algorithm designed to exploit others. It was the simplest code in the tournament, written in just four lines of basic. It was called tit for tat. The strategy was simple. On the very first move, be nice cooperate. On every subsequent move, just do whatever your opponent did the last time. If they hit you, you hit back immediately. If they apologize and cooperate, you forgive them immediately and go back to cooperating. This simple rule reveals the four pillars of successful long-term relationships, whether in marriage, friendship, or business. First, be nice, never be the first to defect. Second, be provocable, if someone crosses a boundary, you must retaliate. You cannot be a doormat. Third, be forgiving. Once you have retaliated, don't hold a grudge. Return to cooperation instantly. And fourth, be clear. Your behavior must be predictable so people know not to mess with you. People who try to be too nice usually get exploited and then explode in rage, which confuses everyone. Tit for tat wins because it teaches the other player that cooperation is in their interest. It is the mathematical proof of the golden rule, but with teeth. The Tragedy of the Commons Picture a shared pasture, open to all herdsmen in a village. It's a nice grassy field. Logic dictates that every herdsman will try to keep as many cows as possible on the commons. After all, if I add one more cow, I get 100% of the profit from the milk and meat, but the damage, the overgrazing, is shared by everyone in the village. The cost, to me, is a fraction, but the gain is total. The problem is, every single herdsman comes to this same rational conclusion. They all add just one more cow. The grass disappears, the soil erodes, the pasture dies, and suddenly everyone's cows starve. This is the tragedy of the commons, and it is the single most terrifying law of game theory because it governs our planet's survival. You see this every day. It is why public bathrooms are gross. It is why the ocean is filled with plastic. It is why we have traffic jams. Roads are commons that we overuse because the cost of driving is individual, but the cost of congestion is shared. The tragedy is that individual rationality leads to collective ruin. We are biologically programmed to maximize our short-term gain and ignore long-term distributed costs. Solving this requires changing the game itself, introducing regulation, privatization, or social shame to make the cost of that extra cow or that extra plastic bottle immediate and personal. Without external rules, the math says we will consume our world until there is nothing left. 
Dollar auctions and the sunk cost addiction. Here is a party game that will ruin your friendships. It's called the dollar auction. I hold up a $20 bill and say, I am going to auction this off to the highest bidder. The rules are simple. The highest bidder gets the $20, but the second highest bidder must also pay me their bid and they get nothing in return. The bidding starts innocently. A dollar, two dollars, it's free money. But eventually, the bidding hits $19 against $18. If you're the person at $18, you are about to lose $18 and get nothing. So, you bid $20. At least you break even. But now, the person at $19 is screwed. They're about to lose $19 for nothing. So, they bid $21. Wait, why would anyone pay $21 for a $20 bill? Because paying $21 and losing $1 21 minus the 20 you win is mathematically better than stopping at 19 and losing everything. The trap snaps shut. The bidding escalates. $30, $50, $100. Both players are now frantically bidding just to minimize their losses. This is the sunk cost fallacy weaponized. It explains why nations stay in losing wars. We can't let those soldiers have died in vain. It explains why you stay in a toxic relationship. I've already invested three years. It explains why you finish a terrible movie just because you watch the first half. Game theory teaches us that money, or time, already spent is gone. It is irrelevant to the decision you make now. But our brains cannot handle the loss. We will throw good money after bad, chasing a win that has long since become a loss, just to avoid admitting defeat. How Companies Use Game Theory Against You Have you ever wondered why CVS and Walgreens are always right next to each other, or why Burger King is always across the street from McDonald's? This is Hotelling's Law in action. If there is a mile-long beach and two ice cream carts, to maximize customers, they shouldn't space themselves out perfectly. They will both inch towards the center to steal the other's market share until they are back-to-back -back in the exact middle. They inconvenience you, the customer, to reach a Nash equilibrium of mediocrity. But it gets darker. Consider price matching. It sounds great for you, right? A store says, if you find a lower price elsewhere, we'll match it. You think, wow, they are so confident in their low prices. Game theory says the opposite. Price matching is actually a threat to competitors. It signals to the other stores, don't bother lowering your prices to steal my customers. I will automatically match it so you won't gain any market share and we will both just lose profit. The result? No store lowers its prices. Prices stay artificially high. The guarantee is a mechanism to kill price wars before they start. Or look at airline loyalty programs. These are switching costs. By giving you miles that are only valuable if you stick with them, they make it mathematically irrational for you to switch to a cheaper flight on a different airline. They aren't rewarding your loyalty. They are holding your past purchases hostage to dictate your future choices. You are playing a game where the dealer has stacked the deck and you think you're winning because they gave you a free bag of peanuts. Brace's Paradox – Why Closing Streets Improves Traffic In the late 1960s, a German mathematician named Dietrich Brace discovered something that sounds impossible. If you add a new road to a congested traffic network, traffic often gets worse. Conversely, if you block off a major road, traffic often gets better. This breaks our brain's logic. More capacity should mean better flow, right? But traffic is a game played by selfish agents. When a new shortcut road opens, every driver tries to take it to save time. This mass defect overwhelms the new road, causing a bottleneck that backs up the entire system, including the old roads. The selfish desire to find the optimal individual route destroys the efficiency of the collective network. We see this in induced demand. You widen a highway to fix congestion, and within a year the traffic is just as bad, if not worse. Brace's paradox proves that in complex systems, individual freedom of choice can be the enemy of efficiency. Sometimes the only way to win is to limit the options. 
This applies to your productivity, too. If you give yourself 10 hours to do a task, you will take 10 hours, Parkinson's Law. If you block the road, restrict your time to two hours, you often get the same work done faster. Constraints don't limit performance, they often optimize it by eliminating the selfish drift of your attention. Winning games you didn't know you were playing. Why does a peacock have a massive, colorful tail? It makes him slow, it makes him easy for tigers to eat, it is biologically expensive to grow. From a survival standpoint, it is stupid, but from a game theory standpoint, it is a masterpiece. It is a costly signal. The peacock is telling the peahen, look at me, my genes are so strong I can afford to drag this heavy, useless billboard around and still survive. If the tail were cheap or easy to fake, it would mean nothing. The fact that it is a handicap is what makes it honest. You do this too. Why do people buy luxury watches that tell time worse than a $10 Casio? Why do people go to expensive universities when all the information is available online for free? You are engaging in signaling. You aren't buying a product, you are buying a proof of work. You are proving you have resources to burn. This is the hidden game of social interaction. We are constantly broadcasting signals to distinguish ourselves from cheaters or low-quality players. The job interview isn't about your skills. It's a game of signaling conformity and competence. The first date isn't about dinner. It's a game of signaling stability and genetic fitness. Once you see the signals, you stop looking at the surface actions and start seeing the mathematical calculations underneath. The Mathematics of Human Cooperation If game theory is so obsessed with selfishness, why do we ever help anyone? Why do soldiers jump on grenades? Why do you tip a waiter in a city you'll never visit again? Evolutionary game theory gives us two answers, kin selection and reciprocal altruism. The mathematician J.B.S. Haldane once joked, I would lay down my life for two brothers or eight cousins. He was doing the math of genetics. If you sacrifice yourself to save two brothers, your genes survive mathematically intact. This is the hardwired code of family love. But for strangers, we rely on the shadow of the future. We cooperate because for most of human history, we lived in small tribes where you would see that waiter again. You would see that stranger again. Our brains evolved in a setting where every interaction was a repeated game. Reputation was currency. If you cheated someone, the whole tribe knew and you died alone. In the modern world, we are anonymous. We can cheat and disappear, but our hardware hasn't updated. We still get a dopamine hit from cooperating. We still feel guilt when we cheat. We are biologically designed to play a positive-sum game, a game where, by working together, the total pie gets bigger for everyone. The ultimate lesson of game theory isn't that people are selfish, it's that we are smart enough to build systems, laws, cultures, marriages, that make cooperation the most selfishly beneficial move. We beat the math by changing the rules. We win by realizing that in the game of life, the only way to truly finish first is to make sure you aren't playing alone.